was riding in the van all the way to Lifehouse. I had like multiple things in my mind. I was like, how, how, do I, how would I feel when I'm pregnant? Like, would I, I able to work? That's the first thing. Second thing was like, oh, am I gonna get along with this new people here, new environment? Like, this is an hour away from my home, and I'm a city girl. This is not seems like really city. The first day I moved in, like when I carried my stuff, I came in. The girl was making breakfast. House parent was ready to welcome me in. I feel welcome. I really feel welcome. To the girls over here, the other residents. This right here is Julie, and she is due in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and here is Nicole. She's actually going to be leaving us in a couple of days, but has been here for over eight months. Um, Julie, Julie here is going to be your roommate, and um, if she could show you where her room is, that would be great. Okay. Hey, okay, where are you from? Haley. The first day I met Jessica, I could tell that she she was really shy. She was very nervous, you know, she's being like, like everybody, everyone is when we first come. Julie's the best roommate I ever had. She makes sure I'm comfortable before she goes to sleep. She was like, oh, does this light bother you? Or do you need extra pillow, extra blanket, are you cold? That's like the first night. And I'm like, I'll get along with this girl. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I, I feel, I feel like home. Pretty much. Living at a life house with, with our family and the girls is definitely a juggle. And everybody has their own schedule. We've got our schedules, doctor's appointments. The girls have their own doctor's appointments, of course. Church, chores, laundry. Living at life house is like having really running two households. So we have our personal household and then that and then the girls' household and then trying to join the two together so it doesn't feel like two separate households. We have classes that come to the facility. Um, we have exercising that comes and we have um, a pediatrician who comes and talks to the girls about parenting then. They have these automatic grill baby alive um, babies and they're set to the computer. They can sense when you birth them, they can sense when you feed them. It's very, very, very real. They're getting these individual classes where they sit down and then it's the teacher and the, and the students, but then us as house parents get to come in and teach daily things by just speaking into their lives. My new house parents, Ray and Savannah, I, I really feel that they're a blessing. You're really embraced when you're walking down that path as a young woman in this situation. They actually treat me like their daughter. And that's, I, I miss having feeling that feeling. For many girls, when they come here, you know, maybe they're coming out of dysfunctional homes. Maybe they've never been around uh, even a house with a mother and a father in it, possibly. My name is Serena. And I'm Steve. And we're house parents for Life House of Houston. We have uh, three boys, ages 10, 8, and 3. Miss Serena, she's very helpful. She's very thoughtful. She was the first person to uh, really um, explain to me, it's not just you anymore. It's you and your baby. Serena has influenced my life because she stays up with me almost every night till 1 o'clock in the morning. And we just talk about different problems that I'm facing and how it's hard not really having a family and how she says that I have a home there. And Steve has taken the place of the dad figure in my life and I know how he, a married couple is supposed to function. So he's always there to help me and he's there to listen to what I have to say and he shares his 80s stories back in the 80s. His favorite time is the 80s. When you're a, a resident, a girl that's living at Lifehouse, you are surrounded by this life house family. They're just like your parents, or how parents should be. Serena, she's really good. She, you can sit down and have conversations. We talk till like 12 o'clock, one o'clock at night. She's, she's a mom. She's a good mom. Steve's more of the dad type figure, I guess you can say. He really wants you like know realistically this is what's going to happen. You need to be prepared. I feel comfortable knowing that I always have a family with Serena and Steve and that I can call them anytime I want to and to talk and that I can come back and visit with them. When a girl comes and lives at Lifehouse, she has a big plan to make for her future and for the life of her child. Here at Lifehouse, we 
always encourage residents to consider all their options. And um, when they meet with our adoption counselor, our adoption counselor tells them the same thing. If you're considering placing your baby, what you need to do first is take a very realistic look at what it would look like if you chose to parent. Whenever I found out I was pregnant, I instantly knew that God's plan was for Ashton to have a forever family and for me to be his birth mom. And that was hard for me to deal with, so I got into the Word and I kept reading about adoption. And that's how I came up with Ashton's middle name, Cross, because Jesus and God sent his son to die on the cross so that we can be adopted into heaven. And so I gave him the middle name, Cross. That biological mother really takes sorrow in one hand and suffering in the other hand and lays it all down when she gives her baby to an adoptive family. It really mirrors the love that God has for us that he would send his son to do what he did. My boyfriend at the time, he was trying to convince me to get an abortion. Even my doctor told me I should get an abortion. We help young women keep their babies or keep life and move their life forward in a positive way. And, and we plant seeds of Christ the whole way. People out there call it a fetus. It's not a fetus, it's a baby. I mean, it's obviously, from the time it's conceived, it's a baby. Lifehouse has seen many girls that have come in with really sad stories. That just, this just wasn't something that they had wanted at all, yet they have made a choice for life and they want to give their child something better than what happened to them. I was, I experienced like my, my whole life not growing up with a family, like a mom, a stable mom. I'm gonna be different for my parents. I'm gonna break the chain and I'm gonna do everything I have to do in order to be the best mom. My mom, she treat me and my brother like really good. She made good money to a point that we had like this big house and a car and like I feel like a little princess when I was little. When it was seventh grade, that's when my mom passed away. Then that's when my dad comes out of nowhere like, oh yeah, I'm gonna take you guys now. Like it's my responsibility, but he didn't really like take care of me as, as much as my mom. I didn't grow up with my real birth mother, but I had a, a mother that had me since I was two. I was in the foster care system since I was two. I was placed really in and out of uh, foster care, like different different homes and everything like that, until I got to the age, I think I was 11. A year later, which is really funny, he married my mom's best friend. He told me to tell all of my friends when they come over that that's my real mom. Like, I'm not supposed to talk about my own mother. And like while I lived there for six or seven years, I had to go through his restriction. Because if I don't follow, like he would abuse me. So, but my life was basically just around moving. Every time it was a conflict, I always moved to the point where I moved and I wasn't with nobody, no family, I was by myself. I always told, like from some of my family members, like you're gonna be just like your mom and this, this and that. And just saying stuff that I, what I would not be or saying that, you know, you won't find your way and I think I have. I told her I'm not gonna do it, I'm not gonna follow because that's my real mother. I don't care if you don't like it, if you don't like her, what reason is it? It's my real mother and she's dead. Why are you holding grudges? And then he was like, well then, since you're 18, why don't you just leave then? You're 18, you're old enough, you, they cannot arrest me for kicking you out. And I'm like, if that's so, then I'll just leave. I walked around the neighborhood, and that time was really cold. February month was really cold. I didn't have a jacket or anything. I thank God, because I graduated. I was struggling in school, but I graduated. And I came back home, and I throw that diploma on her face and his face. And I'm like, I graduated without your help, without your money, without your money for cap and gown or anything. I worked for that with my own hand. And then my dad was just like, am I supposed to be proud of you? 
And then I said, you don't have to, but I'm showing your faith. I don't need you. If my mom was here, she will help me. But since you're not going to help me, I'm going to pray from, to my mom and to God to help me, and I can do it to my own. These young ladies have no alternative. We've met some from 13. 13 years old, and they find themselves in this unexpected tragedy and crisis. Where else are they going to go? Their parents have kicked them out. We need to be able to have the funds to be able to support these young ladies, to give them that alternative. That they're going, but I can't abort this child, but I can't take care of it myself. I need, I need the health care. We need to provide the housing for them. We need to provide them hope. LifeHouse was formed as a response to that need that Life Affirming Ministries had in the city of Houston in 1988. They needed a safe house for the girls to go to where they could carry their babies to term, where they could make a plan for their life and for the life of their unborn child and, ha and, and live in a safe place and have medical care and have someone love them through that season. Back then, what made LifeHouse unique for me was, instead of just being against abortion, this was being for something. This was being for helping girls and helping solve the problem rather than just having a philosophical argument against abortion. LifeHouse is such an important part of our community. It's a, it's a home where girls come who want to be here, who want to make some changes and who want to participate in the things that LifeHouse has to offer. I came to live at LifeHouse when I was 16. Through the process, I chose to uh, place my baby for adoption. I lived with Beth as my house mom, and she gave me love above and beyond what I was getting at home. Um, she taught me that I was beautiful, and God loved me no matter what choices I made. She showed me love when nobody else would, and when my confidence was so low. You welcomed me in, and I thought it was going to be a place that felt like a prison. And I didn't know that it was God's safe haven, and that when I came there I was going to be so happy, and that my life would turn around the way that it did, because when you're in the storm, you don't know when it's going to be over. I have seen young women who came broken. I went to Planned Parenthood. They wouldn't do a free ultrasound unless I was planning on aborting. As I was leaving Planned Parenthood, I had been stopped by some protesters, and she had pointed to a blue bus that parks outside, and they did an ultrasound. When I saw the monitor, it was a full-size baby. I started crying, and I told them that where I had came from and that I had nowhere to go. And the nurse on the bus gave me the information to LifeHouse. I'm Christopher Reed, I'm 19 years old and I'm a student at Cornell University. LifeHouse has impacted my life by uh, making it happen really. Uh, I owe a lot to LifeHouse, um, helping my mom make the decision to keep me and give me a good start. Some girls that would end up homeless at um, shelters end up actually in this Christian sanctuary, which allows them to prepare for not only their futures, but for their child's future. If we didn't exist, there wouldn't be opportunities for these young ladies. LifeHouse has always relied on the generosity of individuals and churches in our community. And that's their way to be able to provide us funds, to provide services to these young women and to their children. Uh, so that they can move forward in life in a positive way. LifeHouse is a non-for-profit organization that relies on your donations to save lives. A child was found in a dumpster in a local apartment complex. That is the same exact apartment complex that I live in, where that child was found. And hearing about that makes me hurt inside because less than two miles away, the home is there. Anybody can take that child. That child was left. And without people 
contributing to Lifehouse, these safe havens aren't out there for people to go to. Over the last 25 years, Lifehouse has had the opportunity to nurture over 500 mothers and 500 babies. We would love for the next 25 years to be able to love and nurture thousands and thousands of young women in this situation and their children. Lifehouse isn't just a house, it's a home. When you live here, you're part of a family. I've been part of this family for 20 years, and I hope to be part of this family for 20 more. My vision for Lifehouse in the near future and 10 years from now is to see our model and what we're able to do here to be all over the country. There's an opportunity to impact multiple generations and have them bring that back into their families and then spread that from their families to the society at large. Hopefully we can continue to provide them a Christian loving home where they understand how the Lord loves them and will love that child and give them life. People should donate to Lifehouse because they're helping save not just one life, but two, essentially. We are transforming lives two at a time. It really, really turned my life around. Lifehouse transforms lives two at a time. And I'm very grateful. Lifehouse transforms lives two at a time. When I think of Lifehouse, I think of love, I think of hope, and I think of faith. It is challenging, it's a privilege, and it's a blessing. Why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and longing heaven? A constant friend is he, his eyes are on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me, I sing because